Good afternoon, everyone. This is the House Healthcare Committee, and it is Friday, April 2nd, uh, about 1.30 p.m. So this afternoon's agenda is to have Legislative Council assist our committee in understanding uh, ostensibly the healthcare provisions of S3. And um, S3 is a well, I'm going to I'm going to actually turn it over to Ledge Council to introduce us to what S3 is presenting to us. But uh, I understand that the S3 has been had considerable testimony in the House Judiciary Committee over the past several days or a number of days and is coming to us clearly from the Senate. So um, let, let me let me first well, first, I, either. I'm not quite sure how to proceed. Given we have two, we have two staff assisting us here today. So uh, Katie McLean, uh, Legislative Counsel, and Eric Fitzpatrick, uh, who I know from many years of working in the Judiciary Committee, uh, is also Legislative Counsel and often spends most of his time in the in the Judiciary Committee. Um, so let me let me first just ask out loud. Uh, so what do we have in front of us in terms of S3 and why is this committee, uh, what, what, what makes it appropriate for this committee to uh, understand S3 and take some testimony? And maybe I'll just, as a, hopefully that's a wide open question that uh, either or both of you could comment on. And then, and then I'd like to think about how to have our committee uh, get a sense of the context that S3 addresses and, uh, and the provisions, the specific provisions of S3 uh, that we, that's important for us to understand. So I don't know, Katie, do you and Eric, I'll, I'll kind of throw it to the two of you to kind of throw the Frisbee back and forth, see who wants to catch it first. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll start off by saying that Eric has been the lead attorney on this. Um, so I'll let him really kick it off and kind of describe the provisions in the, of the bill. But in terms of context, I think it's important to recognize that when we think of the mental health system and how somebody could be coming into an involuntary level of care, there are two ways, two, I call them two doors, um, of, um, of how somebody could come to the system. And I think most often in this committee, we think of folks coming in through the civil door, somebody who's not been um, involved in the criminal justice system. And there are still court procedures that are in place. Um, but what this bill is looking at is those folks who are coming in through the other door, the criminal justice door. And um, there are some similar court procedures after a certain stage in the proceedings um, have occurred. But to start off with, the, the procedures are quite different um, until somebody arrives um, at a point where they're committed to receive treatment. And so I think um, one way to think about this bill is we're kind of shifting our perspective to look at individuals who have some criminal justice involvement um, prior, prior to coming into the mental health system. And, and that that criminal justice system is the occasion for them coming into the criminal justice system at this time, not necessarily just in the past. Is that fair to say? This is, there is some issue before the court, uh, a criminal Into justice. The mental health system at this time, I, you meant, yeah. No, it actually, I think- It was a I word meant, typo, I think, no. Well, let, let me, uh, I'm not sure if that, I guess the distinction I was making is that they, someone might be coming into the mental health system with a criminal justice issue from the past. And what I'm saying is that this is a criminal justice issue that is currently before the court. And that's what's, that's the occasion for them, as opposed to someone who might be coming through the civil process, but had a criminal justice past issue. That was the distinction I think I was trying to make. So, um, so what's the, what, how, 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 how can we best get an understanding of these issues at this point. Uh, Eric, is it, is it helpful to help us look at specific provisions or Katie? Uh, 
or is it again more helpful to lay out what some of the key issues are and then look at the the language of the bill i'm sorry i'm i'm kind of catching you off guard i guess but i'm I, no I no not at all that's a common question in this bill in particular because as katie was saying and it, uh, as you've alluded to um it really does cross subject matter areas it really covers the jurisdictions of a couple of committees at least uh even three if you think of the fact that the corrections may be involved in some ways as well um but uh uh it's so it's a it's a a very natural question to ask what's the what's the proposal that's going on in S3 that brings it here and even in the bigger picture of, of what's going on generally. Um, I think as Katie was kind of getting at, um, although the sections are intertwined, it, it has worked out pretty well in the walkthrough that as it happens, the sections that I tend to work on are first in the bill and the sections that she's worked on are later in the bill. So it has worked well when we do a walkthrough for me to do those first sections and then I turn it over to her for the sections at the end. Um, and I think that having done that a couple of times in Senate Judiciary as well as in House Judiciary, that, that seems to give people a good grounding in, in what's going on in the bill. And you know, I, I would talk for a minute or two in the beginning before I um, pulled the bill up and I, I was speaking with or emailing with Colleen to see, because I haven't been in this committee this year yet and I, committees do it differently and I wanted to make sure it was okay to share the screen and build and bring yeah. the bill text up so that you folks Absolutely. can see it. That's that works well. Yeah, that, I think that works well for us. And then occasionally we might ask for the the language to go off the screen so we can talk amongst ourselves or see each other. But yes, no, that works fine. That we we're doing that on a regular basis. Great. Um, so uh, that's probably what we would do. I you know I'll just give you a minute or two about the bigger the big picture. And then uh, dive right into the bill. It's not. It is interesting. It's. It's. Um, and I mentioned this to House Judiciary as well. Sometimes you can you can describe the big picture of what's going on in a bill when you know in a fairly fairly succinct kind of way because uh, it's got maybe got one big picture purpose or one big picture thing going on. That's that's less the case with S three, although it does deal with sort of a unifying theme of. Um, um, the mental health status of defendants in the criminal justice system. I think you could speak generally and say that. As far you know, there, there are a lot of, of specific procedures on the books for how how um, a defendant in that situation is treated in the in the criminal justice system, and then in the in the mental health care system as well. And there isn't sort of one unifying change that's being proposed in this bill. It's, there's a number of different changes. It's not a it's not a a complete structural redoing, for example, of the system of uh, uh, um, the insanity defense or competency to stand trial or how the mental health status of a criminal defendant works. You know, because sometimes the legislature does that in bills, whether I remember working on a complete revamp of the guardianship statutes or a complete revamp of the, uh, you know, mortgage. Not that you guys would have seen that, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, sometimes you do that. That's not this. Th this does this makes changes within the existing structure, um, but it's not a complete revamp by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so um, it 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 helps to give a moment or two a big picture, and then just actually say, here's the particular places that these particular changes uh, are proposed. So uh, if that makes sense, uh, we could do it that way. Yes. And uh, it may or may not, as you move along, you may or may not be in a position to comment on why particular changes are being put forward based on testimony that has been given, or you can uh, leave that to others as you see fit. Sure, yeah, sometimes, uh, yeah, as you're saying, sometimes we have that, that uh, it's sort of based on, you know, clear testimony that people gave or something like that, that we could think we're happy to pass along. and. Other times it's more of a, maybe a sponsor decision or something like that that's less of a, less of something that, that uh, ledge council would talk about as opposed to a witness, but we, right. yeah. Well, so having said uh, that. <laughs> go for it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And welcome, uh, to, and, welcome to House Healthcare. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. And I, I, I know you introduced me already, but I have not been in the committee this year yet. So 
Uh, this, for the record, Eric Fitzpatrick with Legislative Council. Uh, nice to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, here to talk about uh, Senate Bill Number Three, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. As, as I just mentioned, uh, this is a bill that that deals in a lot of different ways uh, with uh, a criminal defendant uh, in the criminal justice system, and in particular with respect to that defendant's mental health status. And as you can sort of tell from the title, it's dealing in particular, the title of the bill, I mean, dealing in particular with the insanity defense and competency to stand trial. And that's what I just wanted to mention for a moment before looking at the text of the bill, those two concepts in, in general, because although, although they both do deal, of course, with the mental health status of a defendant in a criminal proceeding, they are very different from each other. They're different in terms of the timing that the uh, analysis is made, and they're very different in terms of the consequence. So in the insanity defense, if you think about it, is has to do with uh, uh, a defendant's mental health status at the time a criminal offense is committed, at that very specific moment in time. Whereas the what someone's competency to stand trial has to do with someone's mental health status at the time of the trial. Two things are different, and, and uh, a defendant's uh, mental health status can be different at those two different times. A person um, with respect to the insanity defense, defense, for example, that basically is asking the question of whether at the time a person committed a criminal offense, the person as a result of, of a mental illness either cannot understand um, that, that the person's conduct was criminal or that uh, even if they could understand that their conduct was criminal, uh, they couldn't uh, conform their conduct to the requirements of the law. So you've got two possible ways that uh, it could be established. Either they, they could not understand the criminality of their actions, or uh, even if they could, they were unable to, to uh, conform those actions to the requirements of the law. And uh, I see Representative Donahue with a question, which I might even segue me into what I was going to say next. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it is. But I, I you, just, yeah. I, it, it was something I, I brought up in judiciary at all. You, you yes. refer to mental illness and insanity being related to the, the, the mental health status or mental illness of the defendant. And insanity as a defense is, is a broader term than that. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, that's yeah, I just wanted I, to mention it. And I was going to thank you for that segue. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, uh, um, and I, uh, I'm hesitating for a moment because I wanted to bring up the statute itself to say, show the language that Representative Donahue was just referring to, because although I'm using the term uh, mental illness, the, the statute uses terminology that I think we recognize is in many ways archaic and outdated, which is mental disease or defect is what the statute uses. And, and um, I'm using the term mental illness, which I think uh, is something a term that we would use modernly, differently than existing law does. And as I also mentioned, this is not a complete. The bill is not a complete structural rewrite of the of these laws. And if we ever the legislature were ever to take that step, likely that terminology would be changed and updated. Uh, that hasn't been done at the moment. Um, but as Representative Donahue said that that it, and if you look at the language, and maybe I will pull it up for a second just so we can take a, it might be helpful to see, if that's okay with everybody. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just pull it up real quick. Uh, so it's right, does everybody see that screen? Not no. yet. Not yet. Oh, sorry. All right, let me go back to, let me try that again. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Now. Yes. Okay. So this is what uh, I was just referring to. So this is the statutory language around the insanity defense. And it's really in A1, as you see there, a uh, person is not responsible for criminal conduct. If at the time of such conduct, that's the point I was making about it, it's at the time of the offense, that is the operative uh, uh, inquiry there. As a result of a mental disease or defect, he or she lacks adequate capacity either to appreciate the criminality of his or her conduct so they can't understand that what they are doing is criminal, or they lack the adequate capacity to conform his or her conduct 
to the requirements of the law. Uh, so if either one of those uh, effects of the of what's termed in the statute as a mental disease or defect would constitute an insanity defense. You see, though, that term is defined a little bit further in subdivision two, and I think this was the point that Representative Donahue was making uh, in House Judiciary as well, that, that when I sort of term it mental illness, it actually sweeps broader than that. As you see, it says, although, they, although the term does not include abnormality manifested only by repeated criminal or otherwise social antisocial conduct, it does include congenital and traumatic mental conditions as well as disease. So it's, it sweeps broader than, than uh, or the term mental illness, but I sort of have used it as sort of a, uh, a, sort of a shortcut terminology, I suppose I would say. Uh, but you can see from the, from the definition that it in, would include um, other conditions beyond that. So I'm gonna come back for a second, unless anybody wanted to continue to see that. I think Representative Houghton has a question. Yes. And I'm I'm sorry I I didn't really understand that. So if it's vital to the bill, if it could be reviewed, if it's not vital to the bill, then I can figure it out on my own later. <laughs> but I guess I'm having trouble understanding the difference between the two terms you're using. The two, yeah. yeah. It's just that when we refer to mental illness, um, developmental disabilities and traumatic brain injury are not mental illnesses. Okay. Right. But that's they are included hear. within the definition of insanity. Insanity. Okay. Thank you. Defense. Yeah. Yes, they, that's exactly right. Thank you. Okay. And that's helpful in the context of what many of our other conversations make a distinction that's important. Uh, Representative Golden. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you, Eric. Um, Thank you, I'm, you too. I'm just trying to understand the definition of insanity. Is that a legal term? It's not a medical, right? I'm just correct. To, yeah, correct. So, yeah. So that's a legal definition. So I can't think about it in the meta. I come from the medical world, so I'm trying to make sense of that. Yeah, no, it's it's precisely that. It's legal terminology that is has dates from long ago. To be honest, and uh, um, it's uh, it just it describes a legal status, not a medical term, right. and a, and a legal defense, really. If you had a chance to rewrite this bill, would you change that word? <laughs> well, I'd I'd want to consult with many uh, experts in the field before I I did that, but I probably would. But I before I chose what wording would be better, I'd. Want to talk to people who, who no, were... I totally get it, and you have to count <laughs> it and all that. But I was just wondering. Right. Yes, you would change it. That's what I was curious about. Thank you. Yeah, I see, you, Representative Peterson, and uh, maybe Eric at some point along the way, uh, based on that, there may not be that changing one word here would have ramifications for reams of case law and court decisions, etc. So that we don't necessarily quickly or easily change terms that the court has interpreted and reinterpreted and yeah and i think that's you've you've identified that's exactly what Peterson, I, I see your hand i'm just wanting to just make okay. sure we understand in this context of healthcare why terms are not necessarily easily well my changed. my question has very little to do with that i was going to ask uh and by the way hi eric um i <laughs> i wanted i want I wanted to ask uh, Representative Donahue to repeat that definition you just said. You said something, and I didn't catch it. I hope you can remember. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll come back, we'll come back to that. Just, oh, all right. Okay. But, but let me, let me just have Eric. It's just what Lori was asking. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It, we'll do it it's later. It's just that the definition includes developmental disability and traumatic brain injury, as well as mental illness under its umbrella. Gotcha. And, All right, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of terms here that have a lot of meaning and they are terms which frankly are not always used in the, not the common words used in the public conversation, uh, so. Right, and uh, as you were kind of getting at the, what's known as the insanity defense dates back centuries in the law. And uh, 
I think that's been part of the resistance, or, or, or I shouldn't say resistance, that's been part of the, the understanding that <clears throat> rewriting that language would implicate so many years of case law uh, as, as made, I think, has caused some, some knowing how big a project that would be <laughs> is one of the one of the factors that's been involved in not rewriting this stack this chapter of law completely as opposed to making sort of changes around the edges which in some ways is what's been done over the years more recently um you know not that that wouldn't be an interesting project but uh, <laughs> but it, it would be a, a major one and a time consuming one that that um you know given the legislature's time constraints uh, uh, would have to really be thought through. So you've now focused primarily or initially on the issue of sanity and the correct and, 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 and the 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 word that comes with it is the it, it's it's often called the insanity defense, but it's the, <laughs> the statute just talks about sanity. Right. Exactly. And uh, um, we were just talking about sort of what what it is that constitutes the insanity defense, but it also an important thing to remember about it uh, is, and this is because it, it deals with a, a defendant's mental health status at the time of the criminal act, the important uh, consequence of a successful insanity defense. So if a defendant is able to successfully um, show either, uh, either at trial or beforehand through agreement of the parties that they were insane at the time of the offense, they can never be prosecuted for that crime again. That, that defense, it's what's known as a complete defense. Because if you think about it, um, it's basically that a defendant, a person is unable to form the, the requisite mental intent in, uh, to commit a crime. So if sort of going back years for sort of the policy formulations of the insanity defense, it's, it's basically offends notions of fairness to charge someone with a criminal act if they couldn't form the mental status necessary to commit the crime in the first place. So it's a complete defense that, that it lasts permanently. And that's a distinction that's important uh, between the insanity defense and competency to stand trial. So again, if we move for, for a moment into what competency is, uh, that doesn't have anything to do with a person's mental health status at the time of the offense. Not an issue anymore. And under, under competency to stand trial, the question is different. <clears throat> it says at the time of the trial, does the criminal defendant uh, have the ability to understand the nature of the criminal charges against the person? Can they, can they um, uh, understand what the charges are, essentially? Or are they able to participate meaningfully in their own defense? So again, that's a question that arises only at trial. It doesn't have anything to do with what happened back at the time the offense was created, uh, con committed. <clears throat> so a distinction in terms of the effect of that is a defendant's competency to stand trial is not fixed, it's not permanent, right? A person could be determined at one point incompetent to stand trial, say at the, the time the trial is proposed to be happening. And then through treatment or through, or, or through the passage of time, they can regain competency. So that's different from the, criminal, from the insanity defense where the person can never be charged again. A person can be found incompetent to stand trial, be treated, and then six months, a year, two years down the road, be brought back into the uh, criminal justice system and be tried again, not tried again, be tried for the offense at the, that time. Now, it could be that they would never regain competency, and, and in that case, the charges could never be brought, but um, sometimes they do. And uh, it's also dependent upon, if you think about it, and this will come up later in the walkthrough, uh, sometimes a prosecutor can make a decision about whether or not to keep the criminal charges in place after a person has been deemed incompetent to stand trial. A prosecutor can decide that, um, and this happens more commonly, because uh, it's not unusual for uh, a person to be found incompetent to stand trial as a result of what we might call a very minor offense, a very minor shoplifting offense, for example, um, that someone commits, but uh, is determined that they're not competent to face criminal charges. It's not um, necessarily in the interests of uh, justice or resources or time for the prosecutor to bring a criminal case against a person for a minor shoplifting charge if they've been found to be incompetent. So sometimes the prosecutors will drop those charges, um, but other times they will not, and they will hold. They will keep the case open, and while the person undergoes treatment, um, and then if the person regains competency at some time in the future, 
that at that time they could be charged as opposed to the insanity defense situation person can be never can never be charged again in the future if if uh, they were insane at the time the offense was committed so um that's kind of a crucial point to understand and i think it's kind of also the the foundational uh message that i wanted to get across before looking at the text of the bill itself so but i can pause there for a moment if anybody wants to ask any other questions before we look at the text i see representative Bur burroughs has a question could you look at it as a sort of cause and effect that in the uh insanity in insanity insanity itself or mental illness itself is the cause of the crime versus incompetency to stand trial could be the as an effective or as a result of the crime I think under 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 uh, the right circumstances that could be true yeah I think in some other cases maybe it wasn't and maybe that the that uh, um, a person acted in a certain way it just happens to not have been related to their mental status at the time uh, but it could well be exactly could well in certain circumstances could well be that the that the um, mental illness was exactly what led to the commission of the, com the criminal conduct whatever it was well I guess I'm I, what I'm asking is um, or what I'd like to know is uh, what the original aegis for the the law being drawn up was. Was it um, uh, sheerly to address mental illness um, as as a portion of the crime or as a portion of the person? Uh, and I'm not quite following that question, sorry. Um, you I mean, is it more of a status of the person as opposed to their conduct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think the point is to consider the the um, the status of the defendant when making decisions about you know how how much is society going to hold that person responsible for their conduct and uh, that that you know, it's appropriate to consider the mental health status of the person when, when making those kind of decisions about whether or not they should have criminal responsibility. So I, um, in that sense, the, uh, the law is kind of um, merciful in, in taking all, all aspects of a person into account. Well, I think yeah, um, as a from my perspective at Ledge Council, I probably couldn't use an adjective like that. But I would say that uh, um, that oftentimes when courts look at due process, they sometimes paraphrase due process as fundament, fundamental fairness. That's a that's a term that is often used to to help understand what due process means. And I do and and the insanity defense. Uh, does in part arise from due process of law, which is a notion of fundamental fairness. So I mean, that's a similar way to put it. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Representative Peterson and Representative Goldman. <clears throat> yes. Um, when, when, you, uh, when you say that uh, someone who's judged to be insane um, can never be tried again, do uh, you mean for that crime or for any crime they commit from that time forward? Just for that particular crime. Okay, for that particular crime. So if they're judged to be insane, right. but if they commit another crime, uh, you know, they can be judged, they can be tried for that. And yes. that, that has its own separate parameters. Okay. All right. Certainly, yep. Okay, thank you. Sure. But, but it isn't it the case that they might have to be reevaluated in the context of this additional crime where oh, there might sure. be they, further, yep. further evaluation as to whether they were insane at the time of that crime? Yep, yeah. absolutely. They could raise Okay, the way I heard it, it sounded like they were never to be tried again for anything. And that, that's why I want to yeah. make sure I, I didn't hear that. So, yeah. okay. I may not have been clear on that. So, yeah, just yeah, for no, that particular offense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Representative Goldman? I'm just curious again to know as we go through this language, are we going to be making a decision about something about this language um, or is this just informational? 
this I think well that's that's for Eric I think to articulate we, but I think at this point we are making we, this is information this is this is basic information for uh, making decisions about other processes along the way would that be fair to say Eric yes yeah uh, with, we're not we're not going to be making decisions I don't believe about whether this is a definition that should be the what it is uh, this, these these are foundational fun foundational concepts that are then used in making procedural distinctions or other decisions which are being proposed in terms of court procedure or examination procedure, et cetera. So are those the decisions that we're going to be asked to make um, in this bill? I'm not thinking about these specific stuff that you're talking about, but in S3, do we have to weigh in as a committee on something? Yes. Okay. Do we know yeah. what that is yet? Yeah. Oh, we just have to go well, through if, the you, if, you, if we get through there, we'll get to that. It'll be obvious. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, I just like to sort of have a, an idea yeah, of what we're looking for. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's good, yeah. Well, that's where exactly where I was gonna go next is what, what the some things actually are because the that, with that sort of foundational knowledge, um, uh, well, as you can already tell, I, I think from this discussion even, that the, the um, concepts of that are brought up by the insanity defense and, and the notion of competency to stand trial and the intersection of the criminal justice and the mental health care systems are are detailed and complex and and there are detailed statutes on the books that that address these things uh which is some of which is uh many of which are proposed to be amended in s3 and um the the as i mentioned at the very beginning the proposals are, are in some sense particular, pr proposing changes to particular parts of the process, uh, but that's how they're connected. So, so uh, what I would do then is pull up the bill and that way we can sort of identify each time, well, here's the process that, that, um, that it is existing in current law with respect to criminal defendants in these situations. And here's the proposal that's to change that uh, being made in S3. So if that makes sense, I'll go ahead and pull up the language. And I, I guess I just want to say uh, that I, I have to confess, after many years of being involved in one way or the other, not deeply, as, as mm -hmm. Eric and some others have been, I find myself grappling at times with keeping, keeping clear or separated the issues of uh, sanity and mental competency and what applies where. And I think, I think that is often, I don't think I'm alone in that. <laughs> I don't think I'm alone in that. And, uh, and so therefore, it, it, we may need from time to time to come back and re-ground ourselves in what it is that that term meant and, and how, that, how, how one would distinguish one from the other, et cetera. Representative Donahue. Yeah, I just want to say, I've been sitting in on some of the judiciary testimony and there were a couple of witnesses who had, you know, slide decks and a couple of them were, if you want to have it somewhere in writing, explaining those differences and a flow sheet, um, I, uh, they're under my name on our website now so that you have something you can look at um, in a slide deck kind of way on, as, as a refresher or to, to go back to on those terms. And, 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 I trust that those terms as outlined in those flow sheets, et cetera, are accurate. They're both from attorneys. They're both, they just quote the statutes. They just quote, they quote okay. the statutes. They're not, they're not opinion pieces. Okay. Because sometimes people use terms that don't really fit where they belong. Well, okay. if they quote the statutes and they must be correct. It's, I can vouch for their high quality of the writing at least. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you put your initials at the end of each part. Yeah, right? that's right. And I okay. Both do, yes. okay, Eric, <laughs> why, why don't you take us further in the, into the bill? Okay, we'll do. All right, so. Uh, does everybody see the screen for S3 as it passed the Senate? Yes. Okay, great. 
and also and, I should and, and your hand is up is that intended to be up right now no okay Just, uh, hoping not but right can i take it down or should someone take that down for me uh she she should be able to address that herself and she's right. also on mute so that's maybe just as well we don't need to hear okay <laughs> hand down. <laughs> Why don't you well, go ahead? Uh, right and i should i think you mentioned as well uh, chair lippert but i'll reiterate it too that since i can't see anybody please feel free to interrupt oh. me or, or however it is you want to handle questions but uh I'll, I'll try to see if I can. I, we have a practice in the committee of trying to raise the electronic hands and then I'll call on people as much as I can because it's hard to see otherwise. Yep. Okay, that sounds great. All right, so moving right into section one. Um, when when uh, the question of a defendant's sanity or, or, or competency, either one has been raised in a, in a criminal proceeding that could have been raised by, uh, by the defendant or by the prosecution or by the court, depending on the circumstances, um, the way the statute is written and currently, uh, well, uh, generally speaking, when the, when the competency or sanity is raised, the court has to order that a psychiatric evaluation take place. So that's what's going to happen next. Court will order a psychiatric evaluation. Sort of a, a technical uh, point, but you'll see in section one, yeah. the way the statute is written currently, um, the, the, as, and as I just described, and we just spent some time discussing this, Competency and sanity are two different things, they're two different concepts. But uh, the way the statute is written, this initial psychiatric examination has to include both competency and sanity. You see in un, under subdivision A1, there's a struck through and. Uh, uh, it's not the case though that competency and sanity will always be at issue in a given case. Could be that a person's competency is what's, what's uh, gonna be uh, contested or litigated because perhaps the parties agree that the person was sane at the time of the offense, but something has happened in the meantime. There's been some intervening circumstance, whatever that may be. And, and now there's a question about the person's competency to stand trial. So there would be no reason to evaluate the person's sanity at the time of the offense if that wasn't an issue at all. So all this does is clarify the language um, to make it possible, as you see, the examination the new language would have reference to one or both of the following. So it could be uh, that the examination would uh, look at the person's competency, and it, or it could be that the examination would look at the person's sanity, or both, um, just to expand the options there to reflect the reality that uh, the two concepts are different, and they're not always going to be um, at issue in a given case. So uh, after the um, this psychiatric evaluation takes place, there's a report that has to be um, generated by the, by the psychiatrist or psychologist. And there you, you see an existing law, there's a list of people who get the report. It's gotta be transferred, or sorry, transmitted to the court and to the state's attorney and the, and the uh, defendants, or excuse the word respondents, uh, defendants attorney. So they, they all get a copy of the report. And what's added here, you see, is that the commissioner of mental health also gets a copy of the report. The idea uh, here being that uh, this is obviously a question of the person's um, sanity or competency that may result in the person being uh, transferred to the Department of Mental Health's custody. So it makes some sense for the, for the department to have a copy of the initial psychiatric evaluation that's going on. Um, so moving on to subdivision two here, uh, this language actually addresses, as we were just talking about, Sometimes the, a case may involve competency. Sometimes it may involve sanity. Sometimes it may be both. This subdivision addresses those cases where, where it does involve both the defendant's competency and the defendant's sanity. And so this is basically saying here, it's sort of a logistical piece, um, that when that's the case, when, when uh, the psych psychiatrist or psychologist is asked to provide uh, uh, an evaluation and opinion of both competency and sanity, then the opinions are, are have to be presented in separate reports and addressed separately by the court. And then the second sentence there makes clear, again, sort of a logistical piece, that the um, that an, uh, the psychiatric examination of the person's san sanity is only going to be undertaken. That only takes place uh, if the psychiatrist or psychologist is first able to. Uh, conclude that the person is competent. You think about that, that makes sense because as I, as I 
explained at the beginning, a person who's found incompetent is not going to stand trial. And that incompetency could last forever. It might be treated and the person could then regain competency, but uh, that might not be the case. So if the person never retains competency, they're never going to be tried for the case. And it makes no sense for, for, uh, there would never be an examination of the person's sanity at the time of the offense because they, they would never be on trial. And when you raise the insanity defense, it's for purposes of your criminal trial. That would never happen. So it doesn't make sense in the first instance for a psychiatrist or psych psychologist to necessarily, um, if they're, if they're going to be asked to evaluate uh, both, or I'm sorry, if they're, in terms of sequence, it doesn't make sense for them to do the evaluation of the person's sanity at the time of their offense if um, they're never going to be competent to stand trial anyway. They would sort of be, uh, in terms of resources and time, it uh, might never be useful, might never be used. So th this makes clear that, that it's not going to happen until the person is deemed competent to stand trial. So moving on to section two, this, if this, this addresses um, the court proceeding that is required under existing law when a defendant has been found either to be uh, insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial. So after that, let's assume you know, we're further down on the, on the timeline now, on the continuum where the, psych the initial psychiatric evaluation has already taken place and uh, there have been perhaps competing arguments in the court if, the, if there hasn't been a stipulation because sometimes the parties can agree, for example. They could stipulate to the fact that, that a defendant was insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial, or they might disagree and the court might have to make a decision. However, they reach that point. But if you get to the point where um, a defendant is found by the court one way or the other to be insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial, then the court has to hold a hearing next. And this hearing um, is based on a concept that I'm sure this committee is very, very familiar with, and that's the concept of danger to self or others. That's the, the decision point that needs to be made at that hearing. So uh, if the defendant is found dangerous to uh, danger to self or others, then the person is, is committed to the Department of Mental Health for treatment. And that's sort of goes back to the two different doors point that Katie made at the very beginning. So this is the way they're coming in through the criminal justice door to Department of Mental Health custody. Now, this isn't a civil proceeding where a person has either uh, voluntarily committed themselves or been involuntarily committed uh, in the civil process. This is a criminal proceeding. This is a different door that a person could end up in the custody of Department of Mental Health. And that's after they've uh, committed this criminal offense um, and have been found uh, either insane at the time they committed that offense or incompetent to stand trial. And after that, in the course of this hearing, found dangerous to self or others, then they um, are committed to DMH custody. So under current law, uh, the uh, representation of the defendant at the hearing, in other words, who their counsel is, uh, generally continues to be their defense counsel. Uh, but what the proposal here is that, uh, that if the person is found incompetent um, or uh, insane at the time of the offense, then they're, and this is sort of goes to the third law, line from the bottom of sub, subsection B, then they're entitled to have counsel appointed by Vermont Legal Aid. So this is the body that I'm sure you know is very familiar, very experienced with representing persons in these proceedings uh, when, when danger to self or others uh, is evaluated and litigated. And um, as a pr practical matter, uh, they've been involved in some of these proceedings previously, but they're uh, uh, I think had been agreement between both the Defender General and Legal Aid that it made sense for Legal Aid to always be available um, to represent the person at, at this stage of the proceedings because it's no longer a criminal proceeding. They're not, they're not adjudicating guilt or innocence of the offense anymore. All, they're, all the court is looking at is whether they're danger to self or others and it's Vermont Legal Aid that has the experience in those sorts of uh, representing defendants in those sorts of situations. Um, because it uses the terminology entitled, you see, a person is entitled to have counsel appointed. That means they can still choose to have their own defense, private defense attorney if they want, but if they don't, uh, they could have counsel from legal aid um, appointed. 
And the last sentence there, you see also that uh, in addition to, to having counsel from legal aid, um, the Department of Mental Health is also entitled to appear and call witnesses at the proceeding. Again, same idea. The question here is whether the person is being committed to uh, the Department of Mental Health. Um, and so there's some logic to having them be a part of the proceeding as well. Representative Goldman has a question. I do. Thank you so much, Chair Lippert. Um, I'm just looking to understand what problem this language is trying to solve. Because that's what I don't understand the previous context. So I don't know what we're going from to, if that makes sense. Does that question make sense? I think so. Do you mean the language right here, this about the representation from legal aid and- Yeah, uh, B, you know, subsection B, I think is the new language, right? So I'm just wondering why this, someone obviously thought this was important to add because it was solving a problem. And I'm just trying to understand what problem existed that required this. Yeah, I think that uh, sort of uh, as much as possible, kind of brief paraphrasing the testimony uh, that at least I heard in Senate Judiciary, it was that the representation of the person by most criminal defendants, the vast majority of criminal defendants uh, are represented by uh, public defenders, by the Defender General's Office because of their economic uh, status. Um, the, the expertise, though, of representing uh, defendants in these proceedings, again, this isn't a criminal proceeding. It's not, you're not adjudicating guilt or innocence anymore. These types of proceedings, um, whether or not someone, because of their mental health status, should be committed to the Department of Mental Health, that expertise uh, really falls with legal aid because of their experience rather than with the Defender General's Office. So I think both of those entities agreed that it made more sense for legal aid to pick up the representation at that stage of, the, of these cases. So that's why, that's why you've got the change. Thanks, and, that helps. And yeah. while Vermont Legal Aid has a broad range of things that they do, I believe the Mental Health Law Project, uh, if I'm correct, falls within their area of expertise. Yes, that's uh, that's exactly right. Okay, Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Um, could you move that down, Eric? I'd like to see above B there. Yeah. Uh, committed to custody of mental health. Okay, so all right, that that I missed that part of it. So so we're saying that the person is no longer a criminal proceeding because he's either incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the offense. Right. So, so now we're, we're, we're putting him or determining what will happen to him. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay. That's all I need. Yep. That's exactly right. Yep. Thank you. Well, and I think, I think Eric, is it, is it fair to say, or I mean, is it fair to say that being found incompetent to stand trial or insane at the time of the crime does not result in, okay, you're done. Uh, you just get to walk away. If the court finds that, then there must be this hearing to determine right. what, what, now what, now what happens? And I think that's what Representative Peterson is asking in part. Yes, I think that's right. And, and you know, cause uh, as you say, the uh, next question after assuming the court does find incompetency or, or insanity. Um, the next question is, you know, what, what should happen next? And should the person, really that's the existing, that second line down on page three, if you sort of paraphrase a little bit, should the person be committed to the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health? Again, that depends on whether the person is a danger. So if the, if the person is, then they would be, but uh, obviously the opposite is also true. If it turns out that the person was uh, uh, perhaps insane at the time of the offense um, or found incompetent to stand trial, but isn't dangerous to anybody, then there's no reason to commit the person to custody. Uh, and uh, uh, the person isn't, doesn't, doesn't have to be so. And, and again, the dangerousness, danger to self or others, is a different evaluation, a different set of criteria than either the criteria for competency to stand trial or insanity at the time of the, of the offense. Absolutely. Yep. It, it's, it's, it's a different analysis that must be done. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Sounds like we're okay to move a little bit forward. I think so, yes. Yeah. So section three brings us to uh, a large part of the bill, actually. Um, so this, again, now we're moving further along. If you think of this as sort of a timeline, kind of where, where on, the, on the timeline of the proceedings we are. So this, we assume for the, for the sake of understanding this section, that at this point, um, you've gone through the hearing that we just talked about. So, and the hearing um, found that a person was a danger to self or others. So the person was committed to the Department of Mental Health Custody. So this section applies, uh, assuming that to be the case. So when that happens, when the person has been committed to DMH custody as a result of that finding by the court after the hearing, um, the uh, uh, section that you're looking at now deals with victim notification. And this is the concept that that um, the, uh, I'm just making sure I'm in the right spot here. Yes. Uh, so under current law, there, there are not specific proceeding, sorry, specific uh, provisions for victim notification in these sorts of situations. Say, so think about it, you know, there was a crime earlier on uh, prior to the person being deemed either insane or incompetent and committed to the Department of Mental Health. So there was a crime and there may have been a victim of the crime, depending on what type of crime it was. Um, but there isn't any process in law to provide notification to victims when the, the offenders, the defendant's status changes while they're in Department of Mental Health custody. And that's what this section deals with. When in particular, there's different ways in which this, this criminal defendant may return to the community, right? After they've been in the custody of the commissioner, they may, may well return under the, into the community in a variety of different um, procedural possibilities. And what this section does is when that ha happens, when the defendant after being committed returns to the community, it, it requires notification uh, to the state's attorney, to the prosecutor, and sometimes to the court, and who then has to provide it to the victim. And that's sort of the big picture of what's going on in this section. And I'll now talk about some of the specifics. So, okay, well, when does, when is that notification required and how does it work and who does it go to? That you'll see starts here on page five. Um, so the, the first point that you'll see in subdivision 2A there is that, as I just mentioned, this victim notification piece applies after a person has been committed to DMH custody. Uh, after, they, after they've been found, and this is a bit more of a fine point on it, they've been found either not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial, provided that the person's criminal case has not been dismissed. Now, that may remind you of something I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, the reason there's that, that second uh, limitation on the incompetency piece is because, remember, we talked about the fact that you know, someone may be found incompetent to stand trial on the basis of a very minor offense. And the prosecutor may well have decided to dismiss the case completely because it was so minor, it made no sense to keep uh, that case open uh, on the basis of what the person allegedly did. So uh, um, in those cases, you see notice is not required. And this notice is required only if they've been found either not guilty by re reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial if the criminal case hasn't been dismissed. So it's only if the prosecution has made a decision to keep the case open while the person is being treated that this notice piece would be required. And presumably that's gonna be your more serious group of cases uh, because in the, in the less serious ones are the ones that the prosecution will sometimes dismiss. So that's one uh, sort of uh, piece that talks about the universe of, of who, uh, to whom this notification piece requires. So when that's happened, when someone who fits into that, that group has been committed, um, the, uh, Commissioner Mental Health has to provide notice to the state's attorney uh, or the office of the attorney general, if that was the office that prosecuted the case. And you'll see three different circumstances, three different ways in which the defendant could be returning to the community uh, that would trigger the commissioner's duty to provide notice to the prosecutor. And so here the three are Roman numeral capitals one, two, and three on the next page. But here are the first two. Um, so when when is this notice duty going to be triggered? Well. The first one is at least 10 days prior to discharging the person from the care and custody of the commissioner or commitment in a hospital or a secure residential recovery facility to the community on an order of non-hospitalization, an ONH as this committee knows. 
Um, so either one of those things, if the, if the person is either discharged from custody completely, that's one double A, or not discharged from complete custody, but transferred uh, or discharged from hospital commitment or from secure residential recovery facility commitment to the community on an ONH. So if either one of those two things happen, um, then this notice provision is triggered. And so uh, again, you see that that means that it would apply both when the person is discharged completely from custody or when the person's treatment status is changed. Uh, they're not discharged completely. They're still under the custody of the department, but now they're out in the community on an ONH. Either one of those two things would trigger the notice requirement. Um, another uh, subdivision, Roman numeral capital two there, their notification requirement is also triggered at least 10 days prior to the expiration of a commitment order if the commissioner does not seek continued treatment. This also may well be familiar to the committee because um, the, the commitment orders, uh, typically the, the actually I think required by law, the initial commitment order can only last for 90 days. And if the commissioner and the department decide to seek uh, an order of continued treatment, that can last for up to a year. Now, usually what would happen is as you get toward the end of that initial 90 day period, the department makes a decision about whether they're, gonna, whether they're going to seek an order for continued treatment. And if they do, they have to make the same showing that the person is a danger to self or others. And the court finds that the person is, uh, does satisfy that, that, um, that test, then the person could be committed uh, under an order of continued treatment for up to another year. So if you think about that though, um, the department sometimes and can, when they when the end of that say one year period is starting to approach, they again have to make a decision about whether or not they're gonna seek an order for continued treatment. And they may decide not to. They may decide that the person's treatment is successful or uh, whatever other circumstances they're taking into consideration they may decide they're not gonna seek that order of continued treatment. They're just gonna let the commitment order, the one-year order expire. Now, when that happens, notice is triggered because you see that's, if that were to happen, the person would return to the community. And that this whole section is about um, victim notice uh, in the event of the defendant returning to the community. And that's different. I, I moved the language back up again so that we could relook at Roman numeral one because the idea is to capture both folks who are formally discharged and folks who are returning to the community, but they haven't actually been formally discharged. They just, the department has just decided to let the commitment order expire. And that's why you have separate language in Roman numeral two there to cover both of those possible situations. And the last one, number three, is any time that a person absconds from the custody of the commission. So if they flee, run away, escape, that sort of thing, um, that's also the idea here is that when that happens, then dicta, the notification, the notification requirement kicks in also. So okay. what happens when when notification is provided under any one of those three circumstances we just described? Uh, it goes to the state's attorney or the attorney general, the see in Roman number two there, and they have to provide notice to any victim of the offense who has not opted out of receiving notice. So it's an opt-out system. Um, victims may decide that you know, because of re-traumatization or any other reason that, that they don't want to have notice when, when the offenders change in status and they're able to select that option if they prefer. Um, but if not, then they would get the notice. I uh, see the victim definition as a reference to a, an existing definition of crime victim in the uh, uh, crime victim services statute that's already in existence. Um, subdivision C, so this is, We've gotten through the notice piece that has to do with um, notifying uh, based on the a change in status of the defendant. This is a separate notification piece, subdivision C, that you're looking at here. This uh, is a, a, can apply under the circumstance when a person is already in the community on a non-hospitalization order, on an ONH. So a person is already out on an ONH in the community um, but one of two things happens. You'll see the Roman numerals one and two below. Either the person is either not complying with the order, not complying with the, the ONH, or the alternative treatment that is part of the ONH has not been adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. If either one of those two things occurs, then um, the notice is required again. The commissioner of the Department of Mental Health 
has to provide notice to the committing court, to the state or to the state's attorney or the attorney general, depending on who, who um, which office prosecuted the case. So at, um, right here, I just wanna point the committee to one other, just so you can see where this language came from, the, the person not complying with the order or their alternative treatment language. I'm gonna pull up one other um, statute real quick. And this is the existing ONH statute, the non-hospitalization order statute. And there's, there's a similar, a different, but somewhat similar process in law now. Uh, in this case, it's the court making the finding, but you see that, and this, so this uh, is when a person is in the community uh, or, the, or the court can order rather that, um, that a person go into the community on an order of non-hospitalization uh, when it finds that a treatment program other than hospitalization is adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. Um, but if you look under subdivision, sorry, subsection B, you'll see uh, language that similar to what you just saw. So if any time during that period, uh, the court comes to the court's attention that the patient is not complying with the order, which is the same language we just said, or that the alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the person's treatment needs, then after a hearing, the court can consider other alternatives, modify the order, um, or, or uh, direct that the person be uh, returned to the hospital for hospitalization for the remainder of the 90 day period. So um, that's the existing ONH statute. I just bring that up to provide a little bit of context as to where that, that language that we were just looking at comes from. Um, so that brings us to the end of that piece. That's the victim notification nope. piece. Before I, we I know go you can't. On, yep. Yeah, before we go on, Eric, uh, there's a couple of questions and I, I'm gonna ask just a prior question if I may. The reason that this language that is here now, uh, this these notifications do not currently, well, I don't know where they don't, are they forbidden under current law or do they, can they be done if there's a choice to, if there's, if the, I guess what's the status in terms of the department making these notifications currently? I don't think there's any legal authorization for them to right. make that notification currently. Um, so without this statute, I, I don't think the, the authorization exists. It may be a um, violation of some other privacy. Uh, it's a yeah, I, I would actually say that it would be. Um, and it sort of leads me into what I was going to, I, I can hold off. I, I, hear, I hear you say that there were questions. Yeah, there's some other there's questions. Also, yeah, there's a HIPAA a HIPAA point to be made here as well that's related to your question, but I can I can hold off on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Representative Peterson said his hand up, and then Representative Donahue. No question. Okay. Old hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, um, Eric. Could you go back to the um, order of non-hospitalization slide you had up? Oh, sure. So when I look at at uh, at B in terms of um, the potential for revoking an order of hospitalization, that's at any time that it comes to the attention of the court that there's non-compliance. And then B two, one of the things the court can then do is order that the patient be rehospitalized. So would it be correct that under the notice provision, currently they're not notified, but although it doesn't specify what the court or the state's attorney might do with that information, in fact, either the state's attorney could bring it to the attention of the court or the court having been notified could make a decision then to hold a hearing and order that the patient be rehospitalized. Yeah, I think that I agree with that reading. Yes. Yep. And also, I, I, I mean, I've heard yeah. some testimony that says there's no there's no implications of the notice. It's just that they're being informed. But in fact, there would be this implication that the person could be ordered to the hospital, even though there might not have ever been a, um, you know, like a, an admitting doctor hasn't said this person needs hospitalization. It's just that they're not following their O and H, and the court determines that the court thinks the person should be rehospitalized. Yeah, I think I'm not an expert in in this 
existing statute, but, but that's the way I read this statute, exactly as you said, that, that right. um, the court can do that now under, under the ONH. And if, if, they, if they were, if, the, if it comes to the court's attention uh, in, the case, in the case of, because perhaps the state's attorney or the AG is the one who brought it to their attention because of the, of the notification language in the new bill, then that would be a way that it came to the court's attention and they would have those, those two options that you just mentioned, yeah? But the only thing I would add is, is that, sorry, that we'll get to it, but we'll see later on too that um, the forensic uh, care working group is, is also tasked with studying uh, what to do in this particular circumstance. What, what's the right thing to do with the information when, uh, when the state's attorney and the AG is um, notified about a person on an ONH um, not, not complying. Uh, uh, yeah, under, understood. They'll look at the options, but under current law, the court has the authority to order hospitalization. And if we change the statute, which that change is suggested prior to the study group doing anything, then the court would be informed. Currently, they would only be informed if DMH informed them. Is that right? Um, They're not getting, the court is not being informed currently. Uh, oh, you mean on the, on the, uh, with respect to the new language, for example, you mean the- uh, That's right. If the new language didn't pass as part of the bill, it would remain that the court would not have a way that it would come to their attention unless DMH filed with the court wanting to have it revoked. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably true. I don't, uh, certainly, that, certainly they wouldn't be getting the information via the state's attorney or the attorney general or that notification process because it wouldn't exist. I don't, I don't know based on the existing 7618 if there's other ways that it, that, that it might come to the court's attention under this existing statute. I really don't know, but I think you're right. Probably the most, most uh, uh, common one would be from DMH. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, let's, let's, yeah. keep, let's keep moving. Yep. So just the last point before we move on to the next section, because there was sort of a HIPAA health information privacy point could be made here. And you were kind of uh, uh, alluding to that as well, Chair Lippert, that uh, um, the uh, rule of HIPAA generally is that a person's uh, you know, protected uh, health information is confidential and can't be disclosed. So there's been some folks that have raised a question of whether or not requiring this disclosure uh, of a person's mental health treatment status or uh, change in their in their treatment status while they're under DMH custody um, is a, could be a HIPAA violation, and our, our office has looked at that, and we think that there's there's ample legal ground to conclude that it's not, and that one of the HIPAA exceptions applies. That's not to say that it's a, it's a resolved question. It may well be litigated at some point, but in terms of uh, there being a precedent out there to support uh, the the conclusion that one of the HIPAA ex exceptions applies, uh, that's there. And that also is related to your question, uh, uh, Representative Lippert, because without this law, the, the exception that applies, we think, interestingly, is the required by law exception. So that when, some, when, the, when a law has been passed requiring disclosure, not, not permitting, that would not be sufficient, but requiring disclosure of certain uh, health information, then that's an exception to, to the HIPAA statute. But without that law, so in other words, this circles back around to your question, without that law, so if this wasn't on the books, then it, yeah, it would likely be illegal, a, a HIPAA violation for um, these, uh, these notifications about the defendant's treatment status to be transmitted to you know, the state's attorney, the attorney general of the court, or anybody else. It would be confidential and protected under HIPAA. Okay. Representative Donahue, do you have your? And, Anybody else? No, well, and, and just, just, just to say, Eric, in the course of all of this, 
uh, the person may have been, again, kind of looking back at the beginning, the person may have been brought into court, but they, they, may, they may have been charged, but indeed they have not been convicted. That's correct, yes, that's right. So the person, the person has not been convicted of the crime. They right. are still alleged to have committed the crime and they've been brought into court to determine that and then subsequent actions. Yep, that's right. Yep, that, that um, you know, it's prior to conviction, they, they've been either found uh, incompetent to stand trial or, or they were um, taken out of the criminal proceeding entirely if they were found uh, uh, insane at the time of the offense. So they, that's right, they never got to that point. Yeah, it becomes, uh, it becomes it's, 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 a, it's an important point, but one which is kind of easy to trip over in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the interest both of time and our attention on a Friday afternoon, let's keep moving. Yes, <laughs> and I'm just about done with my piece. This is my last little section right here before Katie will take over for the last couple. So this is a, has to do with um, uh, the disclosure that's required uh, under current law. Um, right now, under the rules of criminal procedure, um, when, when the defendant provides notice that, that sanity is gonna be an issue in the case, and that's actually required by a separate rule of criminal procedure. When, when a defendant is gonna raise the insanity defense, they have to notify the prosecution and notify who their, their experts are gonna be. Uh, but um, right now, um, the way the rule is written, uh, the um, prosecution is able to have its own psychiatrist or expert conduct a what's known as a reasonable mental examination uh, of the defendants. And that's an existing law just above the J there. You see that? So that um, that subdivision I covers the existing ability of the prosecution to get their own uh, psychi psychiatric examination when sanity is an issue, when the defendant uh, notifies the prosecution that sanity is gonna be an issue in the case. Um, they say that they can then, the prosecution can obtain a reasonable mental examination. So uh, this is sub subdivision J you see adds that same ability uh, for purposes of competency. Remember, we've talked about this uh, many times today, competency and sanity are different things. So this provides the prosecution with the ability to have its own mental examination, um, exact same language as you see above, when uh, competency is an issue as opposed to sanity. Uh, it's, it's in response to a Vermont Supreme Court case actually that said that, uh, you know, because the, the statutory language allowed for uh, the prosecution to get its own psychiatric report in a sanity case, but not a competency one, then, then the prosecution couldn't get one in a competency one because that wasn't provided. So this does so, provides explicitly in statute that that's uh, an option for the, for the prosecutor and uh, just like it is for the sanity case. Now I should mention on this one as well, there's some uh, different points of view between the defender general and the attorney general as to whether this adding this for competency may create uh, some uh, self-incrimination constitutional provisions. They, they don't agree on that, as you might expect, and it would probably be litigated at some point down the road. Uh, our view is that they both have reasonable arguments on it, but um, the uh, Senate at least was satisfied that there was enough of a legal basis to defend it, as the Attorney General explained, that they're um, um, comfortable having it in there. So that brings me to the end of my, my portions of S3. And um, I'm gonna pause for any questions and otherwise turn it over to Katie for, for her sections. Well, and Katie, feel free to tell me to move the screen here when you need it. Okay, will do. So I just wanna reflect on the fact that, that this was a quick and dive into some somewhat complex uh, language and concepts uh, that are easily confused and not necessarily fully understood by those who are not working in, within this statute. Uh, but I appreciate your helping us try to look at this. Uh, sure. We will, so let's, let's take a look at the remaining sections and um, 
and then we're not going to try to get into what makes sense, what doesn't make sense in these sections at this point, but to really just understand what's here, what's being put forward. And then we'll have to come back to this uh, once we have a sense as also, also of what's happening uh, in the Judiciary Committee as well as hearing from some witnesses. Which goes to Representative Golden's question about what are we trying to do? Are we having to make any decisions? And uh, I think we are being asked to weigh in. We will be asked to weigh in on portions of this new statutory language. Um, but we're not the only committee, so it's not as even as straightforward as that. So Katie, you want to pick up on section five and take us forward from there? Sure. So we're now transitioning out of um, looking at some of the court procedures and we're looking in the next two sections at um, information that the General Assembly is seeking to help future decision making. So in the first section, um, the General Assembly is asking the Departments of Corrections and of Mental Health to jointly submit an inventory and evaluation of mental health services that the Department of Corrections offers to individuals in a correctional setting. Right now, the Department of Corrections has an entity that it contracts with to provide healthcare services in a correctional setting. So this is ask, asking um, Department of Corrections and Department of Mental Health to work together to put together an inventory of the mental health services provided in the correctional setting by this entity. And this report is coming back on um, November 1st of this year. And you can see that it's coming um, to several committees, including this committee. And if you can scroll down, Eric, um, mm -hmm. On the first line of the next page, we see that this evaluation is comparing the mental health services that are offered in a correctional setting, um, and we're comparing those to the services that are offered in the community and looking at how those services may differ in terms of the types of services, frequency of services, and timeliness of services. And the evaluation is also addressing how the MOU that's executed between the Departments of Corrections and of Mental Health impacts the mental health services that is provided by that en entity that does the contracting um, that provides the healthcare services in correctional facilities. So that's section five. And if we scroll down a bit, we'll look at section six. One so quick this, question on that section. Is this, this speaks of an MOU, a memorandum of, memorandum of understanding between corrections and mental health. That memorandum is an existing memorandum they're referring to. Is that correct? That's correct. Not not to create one, but there is one. That's correct. Yeah. It's already been executed, yes. Okay. Um, so now turning to section six, which is the forensic care working group. Um, the first bit is introductory language about who is going to participate in this working group. And the next section looks at three specific pieces um, or topics that this working group is going to be looking at. Um, and you'll see when you're looking at the introductory language, um, the working group itself is not um, terribly specific in terms of which entities are working on which of the specific responsibilities of the working group. Um, and that's because some, some persons in this list in subsection A um, have expertise that will help on one issue, but not necessarily all three of the issues. And I'll give you an example of that. So we, we see in the language that it's convening a working group of interested, interested stakeholders, including as appropriate, the Department of Corrections, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Defender General, the Director of Healthcare Reform, the Department of Building and General Services, a representative appointed by the Vermont Care Partners, a representative appointed by Vermont Legal Aid's Mental Health Project, two crime victim representatives appointed by the Vermont Crime, excuse me, Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, the Mental Health Care Ombudsman, and a representative of the designated hospitals appointed by VOS, a person with lived experience and any other interested as the Department of Health deems appropriate. Um, so you can see that the it's a large group, but if we scroll down, um, you'll see that as we look at each of the three responsibilities that this group has, that not all of the stakeholders will necessarily be working on each of these items. So the first item is identifying any gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure and opportunities to improve public safety and the coordination of treatment for individuals 
who are either incompetent to stand trial or who are found not guilty by reason of insanity. And the group is to review competency restoration models that are used in other states um, that balance the treatment of an individual versus any public safety risks posed by that individual who've been found guilty by not reason of insanity. Um, so in a specific examples that this group is to look into is psychiatric security review boards, including Connecticut's psychiatric security review board, and also a guilty but not mentally ill verdict in criminal cases. No, gu guilty but mentally ill. I Thank believe. you, guilty but mentally ill verdicts. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And subdivision two, we're, um, I, I see that there's a hand. I don't know oh, if you'd like see, me yeah. to Rep pause Rep or. Peterson. Yeah, Representative Peterson, question? Yes, what does the word forensic mean? Oh, good. Yeah, good question. Um, so this is referring to um, individuals. Well, this kind of goes back to the comment I made at the beginning um, of, of individuals who are coming into the mental health system are coming in through two doors, a civil door potentially or a criminal justice door. So the concept of, of the label forensic refers to individuals who are coming in through the um, criminal door. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to clarify that. In subdivision two, um, this portion of the working group's responsibility is looking at potentially establishing a state-funded forensic treatment facility for individuals who are found incompetent to stand trial or adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. So this group is to look at um, evaluating various models and specifically there's a list of items that this evaluation is to address. So specifically it, the work group is to address whether there's a need for a forensic treatment facility in Vermont, the entity or entities most appropriate to operate a forensic treatment facility, the feasibility and appropriateness of repurposing an existing facility for the purpose of establishing a forensic treatment facility versus constructing a new facility for this purpose. In subdivision D, the number of beds that's needed in a forensic treatment facility and what the impact would be of repurposing existing beds um, for this facility would have on the availability of beds for the rest of the mental health system. Um, and then lastly, in subdivision E, the fiscal impact of constructing or repurposing a forensic treatment facility and estimated um, annual operation costs, um, taking into consideration that there are um, the institutions of mental disease waivers, IMD, this is a, a federal term um, that is uh, available through this CMS. Um, we don't get a, the state doesn't get a Medicaid match for um, individuals who are um, forensic mental health patients in this type of facility. So that fiscal implication would, would need to be accounted for. And just going back to the, the stakeholder list, you can see how in this particular circumstance, for example, somebody from BGS with expert, um, expertise and facilities would be um, the right the right type of person to have weighing in on a facilities question, whereas probably not in subdivision one when we're looking at policy um, with regard to um, treatment in the mental health system. So the last item on this list is um, cons looking at the notification process that is um, under consideration in this bill when the commissioner is required to provide notification to the prosecutor upon becoming aware that the person on an ONH, an order of non-hospitalization, are not complying with the order or the alternative treatment is not adequate to meet the person's needs. This is the language that Eric had pulled up on his screen earlier. And this working group is to make recommendations it deems necessary to clarify that process including recommendations as to what facts and circumstances should trigger the commissioner's duty to notify the prosecutor, and recommendations as to steps that the prosecutor should take after receiving the notification. So that is the third piece of this evaluation. And subsection B, we have language that members of this working group who are not state employees are entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement um, of expenses for attending meetings. And then in subsection C, 
we have the the date that this is um, this report is due. So I just wanted to flag for this committee, as I did for the um, Judiciary Committee, that this group is being formed on August 1st of this year, and this report back with these um, three analyses are, is due November 1st, um, 2021. And the report is to go to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee, and it shall include proposed draft legislation addressing any identified um, statutory changes. And then, of course, the last section is the effective date, which is July 1, 2021. So, Kate, you have a question in terms of on page 10 of the, well, on section three, where it talks about consider the, the one of the tasks is to consider the notification process. There's a section in this bill about changing the notification process. There is, yes. And, so and this- Aren't they in conflict with each other? That um, we're, going to, we're on one part of the bill, we're going to change the notification process. And then another part of the bill, we're going to say, we're going to create a study group to study what should be changed in the notification process. This is a decision that was made in the Senate and you're correct, it exactly this subdivision three exactly cross-references the language that's being proposed in this bill that would take effect July 1, 2021. So what this bill in effect does is it makes the change to take effect July 1, 2021, and also asks this working group after that language has taken effect to continue to work on this issue and to come back to the General Assembly with recommendations and proposed lang um, language changes if the working group finds that that is necessary. Yeah, I find that a little odd, but well, that's not, so anyway, I just, as I, or perhaps in the event that the first part of the statute doesn't get adopted, the second part of the statute comes into play if it gets adopted. I mean, there's different ways to, make sense out of this. Um, Representative Peterson? Yes, um, Katie, uh, we talked about the, this bill addresses whether or not we need a forensic facility. What happens right now when someone's considered insane or, or they have to go? I mean, do they get mixed in with everybody or how does that work? Um, such a person would be um, committed um, to you may not know. You may not know the answer to this. I mean, it's a kind of unfair to ask you maybe, but. Well, a, a person would, would be treated as somebody coming in through the, the civil door. Um, so it would be the same okay. standard as if the person is a danger to self or others. And then that person um, available hospital bed, if the person is ordered for hospitalization would be found. Um, okay. And then if a person um, is found no longer to need that hospital level care. They um, either could be discharged there or they could um, be released into the community or into a secure residential recovery facility um, on an order of non-hospitalization. But they're not separate from the people that come in the other way. Vermont doesn't currently have a, a, a facility or um, a facility, right, separate right. unit at this point. Separate forensic facility or unit, yes. Thank you. So it's a reasonable question, Representative Peterson. Uh, one also, I find myself thinking one might also be interested in what's the inventory of folks who currently are found uh, in these statuses and where, where, where have they ended up? So. But yeah, we actually got a chart about that from DMH a few weeks ago when we were asking um, in reference to people from level one units who might be going to secure residences. And we got so, a chart which showed what? Just how many individuals um, and how many bed status. days in that status, right? Thank you for reminding us, and maybe you could bring that to our attention again. I will, right, I'll try to. Passes yeah. in yeah. front of us. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Um, unless there Wait, are. Pull, pull the screen down? Yeah, sure. So let me, let me uh, we're, we won't spend too much longer, I think, today, but this is in helpful laying out what's in 
you know, what's what's here in S3, what's in front of the Judiciary Committee, which actually has possession of the bill. We do not have possession of the bill. Uh, and maybe, and I have not had a chance to speak with the, although we've texted back and forth, we have not had a chance to speak with the chair of the Judiciary House Judiciary Committee, although she had expressed, Representative Grad expressed a desire for our committee's involvement in some manner in reviewing particularly the section, the certain sections of this. But as we say, it's hard to sort out which are our sections and which are not. Um, Eric, can you or Katie give us any uh, information about what the next steps of the Judiciary Committee appear to be? And if you, if you can't, that's fine. I, can, I will try to determine that by talking to the chair of the committee. I'm just trying to get a sense of uh, where things are moving and time frame and et cetera. As far as I know, they're still taking witness testimony, and I think they have more witnesses coming in next week. That's that's as much as I, I haven't heard anything beyond that yet. Okay, uh, Representative Donahue, you've been witnessing that committee for. Yes, they they have more scheduled for Thursday, and the chair suggested that would probably not be the end of it. The chair also uh, stated that she was looking forward to hearing from the chair and vice chair of health care um, to um, hear from us which sections um, we were going to be addressing with them. Okay, well, that's, this is our first step. This is our first step. So what our and next she was step aware. Was, yeah, she was aware we were going to do a walkthrough this afternoon. She yeah, was glad. I, she was glad no, I, had I had informed her that we were doing a walkthrough today. And she had expressed her appreciation that we were doing that absent, even absent our having any possession of the bill. And I don't know that we'll have possession of the bill. Frankly, I don't know that we will. Uh, but um, so unless there, if there's, a, if there's any burning questions, I, this is a good chance to do it, but it's Friday, it's three o'clock. And this is, uh, I think we've had a, this is very helpful walkthrough of S3. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Eric. And I'm sure, uh, uh, speaking for myself, at least, uh, I think there will be times when we need to revisit clarifications of terms that have been used, uh, both in terms of sanity and uh, competency, competency to stand trial. And and I would just say, if you, you all may have noticed, there have been some high profile cases uh, in the media and where these terms get used. And, uh, and I'm not always clear that everyone reading the media accounts has a full understanding of what the implications are of the controversies in the media. So you will have more opportunities to uh, be thinking about that uh, as well. So are there any other questions at this point in time for either Eric or Katie? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Thank you committee members for your attention this afternoon. And at this point, I think we'll go off YouTube.